Hello fellow 5e adventurers, I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis, and everyone out there, you keep your mashed potatoes on the plate, and you can leave your keyboard light displays at home, because Jim and I are going to relay our close encounters of the third party kind. It's, it's, it's third party adventures and books for 5e, here on WebDM. <laughs> This video is sponsored by Unlimited Realms. They're taking pre-orders now for their new Deck of Rumors. They're a fantastic way to seed your campaign with awesome adventure hooks. There is a deck for any theme you might need full of seeds for any kind of session. Village gossip, town events, classic quests, big city intrigue, and aquatic adventuring. Each deck has 50 cards to fill your world with evocative detail and seeds with which to build player-driven campaigns. We back their Kickstarter ourselves we like these cards so much. And it gets better. Use the code WEBDM for 10% off your pre-order through April 2021, and they go out in May. Do not miss out on this, people. Link in the comments and description. Okay, Jim. Today's main topic, it's, uh, there's going to be a few of them, actually, but we're talking third party. Like, yes. D&D, they're, they're coming out, they got their schedule, they're going to come out with their couple books a year, that's fine. But there is a cornucopia of God. third party products that that players and DMs can choose from that are all out yeah. there from different genres, different takes, to, you know, whatever monsters. Right. So let's just, uh, let's today, let's chat about some of our favorites. How about it? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to start off with my hands down favorite fifth edition product period. And I, this is, I, We're not I there are a lot of, there's a lot of heartbreak when I say that, because there are a lot of favorite fifth edition products that I have, but um, the one that is my number one uh, is adventures in middle earth. And yeah. it is no longer in print. Uh, uh, Cubicle 7 lost the license for it last year. They did a big humble bundle. If you were lucky enough to get that, great, good for you. Otherwise, you have to wait for uh, Free League to, uh, to put out a second uh, edition of Adventures in Middle-Earth. And I love Adventures in Middle-Earth because as a Tolkien fan, as a D&D fan, most of my life I've spent going like, well, they're, they're, they're never going to meet. <laughs> There's never going to be a Middle Earth and D&D that works together. And lo and behold, Adventures in Middle Earth goes, nope, we, we got that covered. And not only do we have that yeah. covered, we've done it really well and mm -hmm. served as a blueprint for how you can completely change 5th edition to serve a, a different genre, different expectations of play. And, and I find it does it so wonderfully and and really creates this like very specific experience of adventuring in middle earth right yeah that i cannot recommend it highly enough i absolutely love it from both a dm and a player perspective um whether i'm taking inspiration from it uh for just like baseline D, &D games that are more of the D, &D genre uh, as opposed to middle earth or actually running a middle earth game or playing in one i absolutely love it if you can find a copy of it find some way to get access to it i snatch it up mm -hmm. even if you're even if right now you're not like oh, i don't know that i want it like later on just read through it it's it's really wonderful oh definitely if you're talking about uh finding a way like say and i, I know this isn't a popular thing since magic is everywhere in D, &D now <laughs> sure but is. relaying how to do a lower magic game low to none actually right um, yeah and making it interesting uh i found that 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 when we got to play in it I was so intrigued by like how like you were playing a freaking wizard with no spells. Essentially, but no like, spells, yeah, yeah, the scholar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you were playing a scholar, but you were still like you were helping it every in every aspect of the game because mm -hmm. you're a scholar. You know things. That I mean that is what the wizards are, the wise. These are the right. people who know things. And so being able to relay that but not have spells. I thought was very eye-opening. Plus, we've talked about the exploration mechanics many times. They right. are astounding on on how to actually do exploration as something just as structured as combat, with an, with satisfying outcomes, input by everyone, and actually having a risk reward system based on how you how you explore. Um, mm -hmm. It makes mm -hmm. it feel like the world is actually being lived in. And yeah, uh, yeah. I would I would say the last thing is 
at least for me, that was eye-opening was choosing like what race you wanted to be because each race had a very specific set of things that they could do to bring forward. Like we had our, what was it, our Brelander with their freaking honey cakes to get rid of exhaustion. Like little things like that where you have cultural aspects that are part of the the whole mystique, but they're actually, they're actionable uh, uh, abilities and, and things that you can do in the game. Yeah, yeah. And uh, to, to touch on that before we move on to the next one real quick, because it is one of the things that I love about it, the the way that they integrate the various cultures of Middle Earth into the mm-hmm. rules of the game and into the gameplay itself. A lot of talk goes about journeys uh, and the like and adventures of Middle Earth, but you really can't talk about journeys without also talking about the audience rules. Because at the end of a journey, you're at a potential safe haven. How well you handle yourself there the state that you arrive in, whether or not the people there are amenable to the cultures that your characters come from and don't already have some sort of antagonism towards them that you have to overcome. All of that Mm -hmm. ties in together and they've they've taken the entire experience and made it cohesive and integrated as opposed to fifth editions like these little nuggets and mechanics and widgets that are all over the place and, and they expect the dungeon master to put them together themselves. Adventures in Middle Earth says, here is what it looks like when all of this is put together into a cohesive whole to deliver a specific kind of play experience. And in that sense, I find it wonderful. It's my favorite version of like Middle Earth role playing. No offense, Merp, but you know, you know who you are. Uh, and so it's yeah. a, um, it's a very fun experience. Pick it up if you can. Um, and, and, uh, enjoy it. Even, even if it's just to inspire you for something else with fifth edition. Oh, most, most definitely. Um, uh, let's, let's move on, uh, to, uh, some books that, um, first off, uh, as a preface, preface, to uh, talking about uh, the, the the TPK uh, handbook and bestiaries, we have worked with Two C uh, before. Uh, we mm-hmm, did some mm-hmm. writing for them. Uh, yep. We're currently working with them on our Kickstarter. Um, Certainly. So yep. they are, but 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 to be completely clear and upfront, they are not sponsoring us talking about it. We just freaking love the books. Love these books. <laughs> they're just <laughs> right. They're just well done. So hashtag not sponsored, but here we go. Jim TPK handbook and bestiary. Yeah, yeah. So 2C Gaming's TPK Handbook and Bestiary, of which we contributed uh, Monsters for the TPK Bestiary 2, uh, as well as the Mm. Epic Legacy Campaign Codex. Um, uh, It is like, to me, these books are for if you've played 5th edition for a while, if you've exhausted all of the core stuff from Wizards of the Coast, if you've Mm -hmm. gone through the Creature Codex and Tova Beast from Cobalt Press, if you've gotten all of the obvious sort of like these are the products that you pick like tpk handbook and beast area where to go next because the folks over at uh 2c gaming like have a have a sense for how to stretch fifth edition to new places and to really take what the rules uh offer and and do something new and different with them and fresh and so the tpk handbook is a series of just encounters right like you've got one for every level They're, they tend to have elaborate setups they come with maps and and ways to scale them up or down or how to accommodate them into your campaign it's not just combat there's both social and exploration puzzles all kinds of stuff so it gives you a wide array of, of just inspiration and tools that you can use uh for adding them into your own game and then the tpk bestiary is a type of bestiary mm-hmm. that's like they're wanting to stretch the bounds of what's possible with a fifth edition monster to surprise players, to keep them on their toes, to present them with something new, including ones that are, seem really nasty, like sentient diseases and, and things that like yeah, that, this, this monster's inside your body. How do you deal with that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that I found really uh, inspirational. Um True to their name, they are they carry the potential to be very deadly for the party. So this is more mm-hmm. geared towards players who enjoy a challenge or who are comfortable with with a, a certain play style that that risks a lot but also gets a lot of reward. Um, what I found though is that the the way that these uh, either encounters or monsters are presented and how they're expressed mechanically, I found it very elegant and and like nothing I hadn't seen before for fifth edition. And and that's what sort of initially grabbed me. And then like looking at them and using these monsters and encounters in my own games, I found that these were some of the most satisfying experiences I had with fifth edition. And so Mm -hmm. if you are someone that is 
I don't know, maybe feeling a little jaded, <laughs> maybe feeling like the official stuff from Wizards of the Coast is, you know, hits like kittens or is not, <laughs> is it particularly challenging for your players mm -hmm. that you're just sort of tired of having to come up with a lot of unique elements for your, uh, uh, you know, for your monsters or whatever. Uh, you maybe check out TPK Handbook and or the Bestiary and see if there's not something in there that could surprise you and your party. Um, yeah. And yeah, because I uh, that's what I've... That's what I've really loved about it the most is just the surprises that I get. I'm just like, oh, I didn't. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah, because, you know, a, a lot of tables have like those players that like to just flip through the monster manual. Uh, I know I, I always tried not to do that specifically because I wanted right. to be surprised. But we had other players. They'd have the monster manual open during the session. And it's like, he's like, mm. well, I'm not looking at the monster we're fighting. And it's like, uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Still, what do you do with that monster manual? <laughs> Come on, man. You know, and so I know that that is a thing. I've had people ask me about that. How do I get people to stop doing that? Well, this is this is a good option. Let them yeah. look through the the D and D monster manual. That's great. I'm over here with the TPK bestiary, so right. you don't know what's coming. And uh, you know, hey, just, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Very just, much. Uh, just 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 check it out. Maybe you like something in there. Yeah, check them out. Check them out. Definitely. Moving on. Uh, I have not looked through these, but I know you, I've heard you talk about them many, many, many times. The uh, uh, the prepared one and two, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Prepared one and two are these really little books uh, from Kobold Press. They're basically a dozen one shots um, and they're pretty bare mm -hmm. bones. Right. Uh, in that sense, they're both easy to prep for, usually taking less than an hour's total time from like, I picked this one shot and read it and now I'm running it. Um, but then that also means that they're a good way to like build on for, you know, just like make them custom for your game. And I love products like this. I love things that are like, you can just drag and drop this in there. I need a, I, I got two hours to fill. You know, I've, I've got a pickup game or I used to use them a lot at conventions back when that was a thing, uh, <laughs> you know, and I found that that conventions this, right, right, in person uh, that this dual utility of being something that was simple, uh, easy to prep for and easy to run, but then also served as a solid base for me to develop into something else if I wanted to spend more time was incredibly useful. And couple that with Kobold uh, Press's like Book of Layers and then Eldritch Layers, I believe is another one. All of these products are invaluable for more sandbox style open world play because you can just sort of flip through them and go, okay, well, I know what kinds of encounters are in here. I know what kinds of adventures are in here. I have an idea of where I would put them in my campaign world or the circumstances in which they would come up. If the players do something off the wall, if they go right when I thought they were gonna go left or whatever, then I, I can easily just say, you know what guys, I need a few minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes or whatever. I'm gonna refresh myself on what this uh, adventure is about and then I'll be ready to go. And, and while they're not quite formatted or, or written in a way that you can run them like as is from the book without having read them before, they're also sort of, sort of short enough that if you needed to and you had patient players and you were confident in your own ability to kind of like run things on the fly straight out of the book, that you can do that, right? And so I just find them very useful. They're in my DMs go bag, again, when I had that kind of thing. <laughs> for yeah. like I, I don't know if i'm going to be running or or you know i, I want to be prepared to just in case um i really really like these and in terms of like products from cobalt press i i think that the, the smaller ones get overlooked it's easy to look at creature codex or or uh, deep magic or whatever great products very interesting to use your game but they're also big it's easy to get intimidated by them it's just tiny little things, something for the DM to look at, be inspired by, and have an adventure ready. And in that sense, they fill in a, a niche that's underserved in 5th edition. Uh, yeah, and and, and uh, when I think back uh, far into the past to my last convention, one thing I do, what I love about Cobalt Press in, in general, is just the, just the, the, I'm trying to think of the proper word to encompass just the, the breadth of, of products that they do have because yes. there yeah. are a ton a ton of them and it's it's it fills a niche uh it's exactly the info that you want which is much like our patreon or if you want to head on over there you can get a, a podcast every week where we actually did uh interview wolfgang bauer uh the, the cobalt press guy so you could you could check that interview out with with the main man himself 
Um, but uh, on to uh, another one, uh, and this is a product I love, and I'm totally jealous of you and Emma for getting to play with them using yeah. it. But <laughs> as fans know, I'm a sci-fi guy myself, and uh. Esper Genesis is is a damn fine rendition of science fiction using the 5e rule set it is mm, it's you know i I know there's an expanse game out but if you wanted to play the expanse with 5e like that's how i would do it Um, yeah it 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 builds itself as heroic sci-fi and i think that really fits it um, yeah. you know, we have, uh, have had the pleasure of, of playing with the designer, uh, Rich Lesclair himself, uh, at, at PAX Unplugged, uh, and a couple of times actually, and it's very fun. I think it like takes what's good about fifth edition, which fifth edition is this blend of different fantasy genres and influences. And while it might not do any one of those genres perfectly, you know, you could look at say, okay, uh, you know, sword and sorcery fantasy, there's better systems for it. But you can still do that with 5th edition D&D. Esper mm-hmm. Genesis has a similar thing, but with sci-fi, where it goes like, is it the perfect sci-fi for running this whatever you're, you're looking for? Maybe not, but it can do so much more. And it doesn't take too much to sort of like make it work or, or mold it in the kind of, of sci-fi that you want. And so much like Adventures in Middle-Earth, like... I, I look at this and I go, like, you can use it as inspiration to see what 5th edition is capable of if you're looking to sort of like homebrew or really overhaul the system yourself. If you're looking for a break from fantasy, but you're, you've got a, a group of players that are like, oh, we don't want to have to learn a new system, then like you can go yeah. like, well, this Esper Genesis, like, it, there's whole parts of this that are coming right out of the basic rules of 5th edition. You don't have to learn a bunch of new stuff. And yet at the same time, it's not a bunch of reskins. You know, while they clearly right. are taking concepts and ideas and classes and feats and whatever from fifth edition and sort of updating them and giving them a sci-fi uh coding in many ways they're also changing them at the same time so that it's not just a reskin it's not just a we're calling this a blaster instead of a crossbow it's like a substantially different kind of play experience and i found it very action-packed very fun very fast-paced has an interesting way of handling like spaceship combat uh that, that well i haven't had a chance to like actually play just sort of reading through it sounds interesting and engaging and like it might avoid some of the pitfalls of some players just not knowing what to do while the space fight goes on um mm-hmm. and for someone like myself where sci-fi isn't exactly like my primary geek uh, touchstone um it it speaks to what I understand sci-fi to be, which is this mishmash of Star Trek and Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica and Expanse and all of this kind of dumped into one pot um, and presented to you as a heroic sci-fi game that is, you know, that uses rules you're familiar with, concepts you're familiar with, but does enough new and enough interesting and different to keep it fresh. And the game I would run with it is like Mass Effect. You know, yeah. that's that is the game I would, <laughs> you know, that's, I think it would work perfectly um, yeah. uh, for a, a sci fi setting like that. And I, yeah, I'm, I can't wait to actually sit down and run a full game of Esper Genesis uh, personally, because it it just it feels good. It's got that feel that uh, that works. Yeah. You know? uh, neither can I, Jim. Uh, <laughs> neither can I. I. I hope to be one of those players, please. Oh, oh. God. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I want to play sci-fi. Um, all right. Uh, 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 yeah. Esper Genesis, two thumbs up. Um, two thumbs up. Moving on to our last one here, which, again, uh, not all people want to learn a new system. So some systems have to go, okay, well, let's talk in your language. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and and this one, once again, would like to uh, tell the people out there, this is not a spon- They're not sponsoring us. We just, uh, long-time listeners know how much I love Cypher and Numenera. Right. So it makes sense to talk about Arcana of the Ancients. And we did write the, the forward for it. Monty Cook Games asked us to write the forward, and we did. Um, yeah. Because I feel, yeah. I personally I personally feel Numenera is, a, is, a, is an amazing expression of science fantasy. Yeah. And to bring that to Dungeons and & Dragons and, and 5e, the way that they did with Arcana, their Arcana of the Ancients Kickstarter, which includes uh, Beneath the Monolith and, and Beasts of Flesh and Steel... <laughs> which did I have all those books next to me right now. Um, I can show them if you want. Uh, no, uh, like I, to me, like I, I wanted more because most, when people are really fans of something, 
like they 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 want the most they think mm-hmm. it's mephisto spoiler right. alert <laughs> but it's not and so like to me i wanted arcana of the ancients to be like no no no, these are all the cypher rules just altered for fifth edition <laughs> but no that's not what it is it's just no, no, a, no. it's a presentation of the world and, and some adventures and yep. a great uh, uh, uh display of the monsters and ciphers and, and, and the technology, the Numenera, as it's called, right. um, but in a 5e setting. And, and just yeah. to throw a little bit of that spice in there, of the the, 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 the knowledge from, from the before time, uh, I think it's, yeah. a, it's, a great, it, it, it's a great way of just like, you know, let's see if you're, do your players like this? They walk through this tunnel and they end up uh, in this place. They can right, leave any time. Right. Yeah, yeah, um, it, it it has a really interesting sort of approach to it, right? Because it's not like a full conversion, but it says here's no. this here's something you could introduce. This is in the deep time of your of your world's past, right? And and like functionally, there's no difference between this high technology and magic, right? They function virtually the same. People's understanding of them is virtually the same, but like aesthetically, there is a difference. And so Arcana of the Ancient starts out with this adventure that will introduce these things into your campaign and give your players a chance to either go, nope, this was a one-off thing, you know, we're done, or to say, yes, we really like this, let's have more of it. And then it introduces the cipher rules, which I absolutely love ciphers because they're one use items, right? That could be just about anything. And so you don't have to worry about how balanced they are. You can have something mm-hmm. that's like, wow, that's really, man, that's a really effective <laughs> tool that you just use. Good thing you could only do it once, right? Yeah. Uh, you get a chance to do something really powerful, really unique, really special. And, and uh, Arcana of the Ancients introduces that. They all of them have different monsters that you could use. Um, Beasts of Flesh and Steel serves as the sort of monster manual uh, of the trio. And then beneath the monolith is actually like play in the ninth world of Numenera using fifth edition. Um, So you have different ways that you can kind of incorporate these into your own fifth edition game, whether it's just Arcana of the Ancients and being inspired by it, maybe running the adventure and sort of hinting at it, or a full blown, no, we want to play Numenera. We like the idea of this like, earth billions of years in the future that's been changed and somehow people are still around but it's also sort of medieval-ish you know uh just Mm -hmm. it's they're using liquid swords and you know all these different kind of like science fantasy uh numenera Mm -hmm. um but you don't necessarily want to learn a new system right you've got fifth edition that your group is into um there's a lot of different ways that you can engage uh with this and incorporate them into your own games that i really like and in that sense, it's, it, it scratches a lot of my itches because I absolutely love science fantasy as well, especially that blurring of the lines. Is it magic? Is it technology? Did the, the civilizations of the ancient past, like in, in setting, the you know, current people see them, all that is magic, but maybe not before, right? To, to use an example from Forgotten Realms, it's like, who's to say that the flying cities of Netheril weren't technological in some way? And it's only the current understanding that expresses itself uh, or, or sees it as magical. Uh, it, it gives you a lot of different options for how to incorporate that, how to make use of it, and then just a big toy box full of stuff to play with and incorporate into your games. Yeah, so break out that artificer and go to town. And, uh, oh, gosh, enjoy. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a party of artificers exploring right. the ninth world. That's exactly what you want. Yeah, uh, yeah but- I get a lot of fun with that. If you, if you're worried about you know shelf bloat, uh, sure. you can take these uh, these uh, uh, suggestions and and go with them or not. Hey, mm-hmm. uh, but these are just uh, this is this is what we love and uh, yeah, it's a great way yeah. to expand on five e. Absolutely, I don't think five e is going anywhere for a while. I don't. I think it's going to be a long time before we see a sixth edition. And and if your group is committed to it, if you're enjoying the system, but you want to see where it can stretch, where it can do, I think like looking past the sort of assumption that because it's third party it's it's not going to fit or it's going to break your game or it's going to you know be disruptive it has the potential to you still want to be careful with that but you would want to be careful with that with tasha's or xanathar's or any of the official stuff that comes out right and so i think just because it's third party just because it's not made by wizards of the coast doesn't mean it doesn't have something to offer for you and um yeah i think exploring all the different ways that the game can 
can go, the directions that the official developers don't want to take the game, but it still could. Um, that that's rich ground for uh, for some fine, fine gaming. 